In this video, we'll consider a one-dimensional problem of the heat equation, taking into account uh, time dependence. So the partial derivative of the heat distribution with respect to time is no longer equal to zero. And to justify a one-dimensional problem, we're going to consider a very long pipe whose radius is a much, much smaller than the length. So we can essentially ignore anything that happens uh, transversely in, in the pipe. And we're only interested in what happens along this dimension. So our heat equation now looks something like this, where the Laplacian is only, uh, the only term of the Laplacian that survives is this one over here. And we'll impose boundary conditions uh, in this problem, but because of the time dependence, we also need uh, to specify initial conditions. So the heat distribution along the pipe when we uh, started the experiment. So whatever we call time is equal to zero. And for the sake of the example, we're going to take an initial condition as a generic function f of x. And in this first example, we're going to uh, solve for the heat distribution given the following boundary conditions. Okay, so the heat distribution on this part of the pipe is equal to zero. So it could be it's at zero degrees. And at the other side, it's also equal to zero degrees. So this is a Dirichlet problem. And of course, subject to these initial conditions. So we'll attack this problem again with separation of variables. which tells us that our heat distribution, which is in general a function of x and t, can be separated into an x dependence and a time dependence, subject to these boundary conditions. So whatever x dependence it, it has, it still has to satisfy these two boundary conditions. So plugging this into our partial differential equation up here. We end up with this expression here. So what we did here was uh, move this over to the other side and that's this term over here is this one. And this term is this over here. And just like we did for the previous example, we're going to divide out by u, which is equal to x times t. This is equal to zero still. Bringing this term over to the other side. We're again left with this expression. And uh, this will always come up when you try to solve a partial differential equation by separation of variables. You're going to get that uh, some quantity that depends on 
a certain variable has to be equal to a quantity that depends on a different variable. And again, to be able to, to do this, both of these have to equal to a constant since this depends on time and this depends on position along the pipe. So, because of this extra kappa, we are going to take that So this has to equal to a constant. So we're going to take that this is equal to minus lambda, where here lambda is greater than zero. So it's a positive number. And this means that this side over here if this is equal, if this quantity is equal to minus lambda, this quantity over here has to equal minus kappa lambda. And even though these two are constants, we're going to keep the kappa separate because this is a physical quantity that might be of interest in our final solution. So once again, we've reduced our partial differential equation into a set of ordinary differential equations that we know how to solve. In particular, you should recognize this as a second order differential equation with constant coefficients. And this is uh, a separable differential equation, which we've seen how to solve. All right. So I won't go through the details of solving them. You can, you can and should fill in the details. But what you end up with is you again get uh, imaginary solutions to the auxiliary equation for the second order differential equation, equation with constant coefficients, which we, we express as trigonometric functions. And for our separable equation for time, we get a constant and an exponential, exponentially decaying dependence. So we can apply our boundary conditions to this solution here. This says that x of zero, which this term is equal to zero, cosine of zero is equal to one, which leaves us with a one. This has to equal to zero. So those were the boundary conditions we were given initially. So this tells us a one has to equal zero to satisfy that. Our second boundary condition tells us that at the other end of the pipe, so when x is equal to l, this gives us this. We had also said that equal to zero. And just like in the previous example, we have two ways of satisfying this, either a2 is equal to zero, which tells us that nothing happens. So it's not interesting. Or sine of the square root of lambda times L is equal to zero. Okay, so we'll ignore this one. And once again, there's multiple ways of satisfying this condition, the sine of square root of lambda times L being equal to zero. This tells you that square root of lambda can be equal any one of these values for n is equal to zero, one, two, etc. cetera. 
And again, we'll add a little subscript n over here to say that there's multiple solutions to this equation. So what we're left with after our boundary conditions is we have multiple solutions for x. We'll call it our constant a2, we'll now call it an. And we still don't know anything about t. We just know the value of lambda. So for our trial solutions, we have u sub n of x and t is equal to, uh, we'll combine this a n with this constant b into a new constant, which we'll call c sub n. We're going to replace the value of lambda here, which is the square of this. So n squared by square L squared. We have the kappa that we had over here and time. So this is our, our time dependence. And then the dependence on X is the sine function that we had over here. And now we have an analogous problem. This solution can't by itself satisfy our initial condition. Which was that the heat distribution at the beginning of time was some function of x. Okay, and it's the same problem. If you plug in t is equal to zero here, this term is equal to one. So you're left with cn times the sine of n pi x over l. And while this is a function of x, you have no way of determining the value of these coefficients. So we're going to resort to the same trick as last time. We're going to construct a function which can satisfy this initial condition by super superimposing all of these all of these solutions. Okay, so our, our new solution will just be u of x and t. There's infinitely many of these solutions because n can be any integer number. So our sum has to go to infinity and writing this out. we get this for our, uh, our constructed solution by superposition. So now we can try to apply the initial condition to this function. So plug in t is equal to zero makes this term equal one. So you're just left with this and pi x over L. And this has to equal to some function of x. So you see, we've run into the same condition. We're essentially trying to create a Fourier series representation of as function f of x that we imposed as, a, as an initial condition. So again, what we need to do is find the coefficients cn by using the orthogonality of the sine function. 
now the period is from zero to L instead of H, just because we're using uh, different variables. This has to equal to this, where again, this is the Kronecker delta. So this just says that when n and m are equal, this is equal to L over two. And when they're not equal, this is equal to zero. So as before, we start out from something like this. And to use the orthogonality condition, we multiply both sides by sine m pi x over L and integrate over one period. This part is just a constant, so we don't need to include it in the integral. And just as before, this collapses the sum to a single term when n is equal to m. We're just left with L over two. And we are the term where these two are not equal, where n and m are not equal, it's just equal to zero. So we're left with this expression for our coefficient. And this uh, index m is just a dummy index. We can replace it by n and it still, it still holds. So the solution to our uh, Dirichlet problem is this one that we constructed by superposition. where these coefficients Cn are found by calculating this integral. So if you're giving a definitive function f of x, you can calculate this integral and find your uh, general solution. So this is another example illustrating how separation of variables can be used to solve the heat equation with time dependence for a Dirichlet problem. In the next video, we'll look at uh, a Neumann problem. So Neumann boundary conditions where we specify the, uh, the heat flux at the ends of, of a rod.